Hey, how are you? Welcome to Bible study. Tonight we're going to be looking at our community again. What has God made us to be a part of? What has he given us in the church and why do we care really? Um, so we're going to uh, hopefully grow uh, a little bit in our understanding of what church is all about tonight. It's Monday where I am in the timeline of history, Monday afternoon. It's my sister's birthday and it's also the birthday of the LCMS today. 174 years young, you're looking pretty good if you're LCMS. If you're not LCMS, then you're looking pretty good. Um, but we are uh, blessed to be together tonight, and we pray that the Lord's blessing would be upon this time of study, that his word would be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll get right into our, our text. So, uh, Heavenly Father, we give you most humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all humanity. We praise you for the creation of us, for the preservation of us, and for all the blessings you give us in this life. But above all, Lord, we praise you for your love that you give us in the redemption of the world by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We, we praise you for the means of grace and for the hope of the glory that's waiting to be revealed. We ask you to give us the, the awareness of all your mercies, that we would show forth praise with our lips and our lives. We ask this through the infinite mercy that you have for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So let's go into our, our slides. Um, we got a, a song tonight that is a beautiful one, and um, we are, um, oh, man, I got to get my, uh, my window up here for you guys. Bloop, 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 uh, I think this is it. Yeah. So we got a song that, um, yeah, I apologize, my white shirt, it's not actually white, it's kind of like a reddish pink, but it, it looks like I'm a floating head tonight, so um, that didn't work out. All right. Uh, Jesus, thy boundless love to me. I could not find a uh, publicly available rendition of this one, even the melody. But I'm going to sing it for us because it's just got a beautiful melody, hauntingly beautiful, and the words just go so well with it. So uh, bear with me. If you want to hit the mute button, I won't be offended or know uh, about it. But it goes like this. Jesus, thy boundless love to me, no thought can reach, no tongue declare. Unite my thankful heart to thee, and reign without a rival there. Thine holy, thine alone I am, be thou alone my constant flame. O oh, grant that nothing in my soul may dwell but thy pure love alone. Oh, may thy love possess me whole, my joy, my treasure, and my crown. All coldness from my heart remove, my every act, word, thought, be love. This love unwearied I pursue, and dauntlessly to thee aspire. Oh, may thy love my hope renew, burn in my soul like heavenly fire. And day and night be all my care to guard this sacred treasure there. In suffering be thy love my peace, in weakness be thy love my power. And when the storms of life shall cease, O oh Jesus, in that final hour, be thou my rod and staff and guide, and draw me safely to thy side. The ending of it, it's just that kind of twisty there, but uh, uh, just beautiful words. The... Um, um, the picture here in the end ties great with our, our Good Shepherd Sunday we had yesterday, if you're watching this on, on April 26th. Um, but this, uh, I rod and they staff, they comfort me. Uh, but just beautiful, beautiful words in there. This Gerhardt hymn, one of our Lutheran hymnists, hymnists theologians, whatever. Uh, <laughs> brilliant words there. So uh, with that to kind of center us, we are going to build on this beauty that we have um, that Jesus has... His love is unbounded for us, and, and he gives it to us. It's a, something that we need to receive. And so we, we pray in this prayer, this song, that we would uh, have the coldness of our heart removed and, and be transformed so that everything we do is word and actions of love. Again, great tie-ins to our First uh, John chapter 3 reading yesterday. Uh, let us not love in word or 
or, or action, but indeed and in truth. Anyways, I, I forget the perfect, I shouldn't butcher the word of God um, publicly, but, but here we go. Let's get into today. This is week two, uh, session two, the Lord's giving, our receiving. And um, what? People who are part of the church don't come to church? Why? This is, so last week we talked, and, and we'll do a little bit of dabbling into last week's lesson to answer a question that came through, uh, but last week we talked about uh, why the church, how the church came to be, and, and I started off with a little bit of statistics about how many people are um, no longer membering themselves, becoming members of the body of Christ in the physical geographical locations of our communities, that is congregation. So, so people might attend church, they might call themselves Christians, but they don't need in their mind to be members. Um, so we talked about where the church came from, and, and we didn't really resolve that, uh, and that's kind of what this whole study is going to be about over the next five weeks from today, including today. Um, but we're going to uh, talk today, uh, we're going to get into why people would want to come to church, what's actually happening when we gather together as the body of Christ. And uh, so statistics for you, this is Pew Research Center, P-E-W Research Center. And I think it's called that because of the church pews. I don't know. But they have some uh, pretty helpful studies. Unfortunately, they're not done very often. These statistics are from 2014. And I think they did the same study in 2017, but I could not find the answers in an update. Um, but needless to say, I think we would agree that this trend, we, we could observe this trend has gone down, much like last week we saw the trend going down of people being in membership. But let me unpack this real quick for you. So attendance at religious services by religious group. So the percent of adults who attend religious services. So over here are religions. And what we see in these, uh, the, the lines are what percentage of these identifying themselves in these religions attend church services. In the dark blue, at least once a week. In the uh, light blue, once or twice a month or a few times a year. Uh, the... <laughs> slightly darker blue, uh, seldom or never, and, and there's a small part of people who don't know where they are. <laughs> All right, so uh, maybe they don't know what a church service is. Um, but, but anyways, where, where are we as LCMS Lutherans, again, for, for our church body here in this chart? We are considered evangelical Protestants. Um, so this, um, I can't uh, get in, I'm not going to unpack what the Pew Internet uh, Research uh, Group identifies for evangelical Protestants, but basically this grouping of people take the Bible to be God's uh, word, authentic word, without error, the inerrancy of scripture. Um, they're of the Protestant, not Catholic tradition, um, and that's over and against the mainline Protestants who who might have a more liberal interpretation of scripture and say, well, God's word is God's word when, when we feel like it's God's word. It's probably a disingenuous way for me to describe them, but, but anyways, our, our ELCA, uh, Lutheran brothers and sisters are in this group where we are over here with the Wisconsin Synod um, and a couple other smaller Lutheran bodies. So anyways, just to, to kind of orient you to this chart. So look at, we're doing great. At least once a week, 58% of evangelical Protestants are in church in 2014. 30% are there once or twice a month, a few times a year. But you can see how that, that chart uh, goes up and down and in Lots of different religious uh, orientations, persuasions. The Jehovah's Witnesses are very uh, active in their... their um, so um, we are going um, to... I'm, I'm just going to leave this there for just a moment because what, um, what else, so anecdotally, that I've noticed in my long experience as a pastor, um, and we've actually talked quite extensively, maybe just a little bit about this as a staff and, and with the Board of Elders, we, um, we in the past, were... Um, would regularly uh, look at what our average weekly attendance is. And what Pastor Love started doing, and I think it's a great metric um, a lot of churches are using, is what is your three-week average total? Um, so the total individuals that attend church within a three-week window, I think is how we're counting it, or maybe it's he does it within a month. But anyways, it's, it's kind of like a rolling attendance because schedules, priorities, whatever it might be that keeps people from being in this dark blue at least once a week. Uh, they fall into this once or twice a month category. Um, and, and you see a more authentic number for active membership in a church, if you will. Um, and and to, be, um, to be kind with the best construction, a lot of times people travel for work or for, 
for pleasure, and they go to a different church on those weekends. And so um, seeing who's in church once in a month is a better metric of who's in church every weekend, at least in our current culture, um, at least it makes us feel better, all right? Oh, good, we got 800 people in church this month as opposed to 400 on average or 300 or whatever it might be, um, the, the different church sizes and, and those numbers. So um, participation in church, why, and the reason I start off with this statistic uh, is because when we realize, and, and I think um, uh, why, to answer this question, I went back real quick. To answer this question, why don't people come to church? I, I think they're, they're not remembering, recalling, or holding in the front of their mind or prioritizing what God is doing in church. So we're going to talk about that tonight, and that's going to be uh, kind of the core, heart and core of our study. So um, let's uh, look real quick to orient ourselves. This is what we did last week. We talked about the origins and what forgiveness role plays in the church, the beginning of church, and how Christ is present, and that's where the church is. Tonight, we're going to talk about giving and receiving, how God initiates. Uh, next week's going to get into fellowship. Week four, pastors. Number five, we're not alone. And six, the, the different kingdoms, that realms that we're a part of. So follow-up question from last week. Uh, where were the... 120 people hanging out with the apostles in Acts 1.15, possibly some of the same people that started following Jesus after he raised Lazarus, or where, when did they start following Christ? So uh, thanks for the question. Um, this is Acts 1.15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. So um, where did these people come from? We don't know. Um, yes, very likely some of them started following Jesus after he raised Lazarus. Some of them might have been there. The crowds might have been there. They might have been the same Palm Sunday crowds or even the Good Friday crowds, you know, the Hosanna crowd or the Crucify Him crowd. Um, these all are very possible. These might have been some people who saw Jesus during the 40 days before his ascension, after his resurrection. All of these things are valid possibilities. We can't know for sure because we don't have a, an attendance list and, and there's not a lot of an accounts, historical accounts of of where people first encountered Christ, other than the, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles. Um, really, those are the ones, I think, uh, where we get their um, first conversion stories. I, I mean, but even then you might make an argument to say, well, they were raised in the, the, the faith of Israel, the faith of God's people. And so, um, yeah, we don't get those individual biographies, but we do get, um, in the New Testament, we get to know some people uh, like Philemon, um, Aquila, Priscilla, and, and lots of other Christians in the book of Acts show up and, and then the New Testament writings as, as people who were converted. Um, but again, we don't know where they came from. One that kind of, this question kind of makes me think about the, uh, the Mark, um, because there's a, a church tradition that says Mark was the rich young ruler. And I should have looked up where that story shows up in the uh, um, in the Gospels, but he's he's the one that comes to Jesus and says, "What must I do to inherit e e eternal life?" And and the the um, Jesus says, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength." And, and and the guy says, "I've done these." And then he says, "Well, then go sell all your possessions and, and give it to the poor and come follow me." And the man went away sad. Uh, again, like I said, church tradition holds that that was Mark and that he encountered Christ there and then came back around and met up with the apostles in the Book of Acts and then. Uh, later on became the uh, author of the Gospel of Mark. So um, good question, good thing to consider. We, we see a lot of the early church growing really rapidly. The, the number 5,000 is thrown around. Um, I think we had that in, in um, Acts 4, our reading yesterday in, in church. Um, so lots of immediate growth. And, and yeah, I think there was probably some overlap. How many and was it holy, these people? I, we don't know and can't know, but I think it would be safe to assume that this event, uh, these events, which took place near Jerusalem, were most likely influential in, in gathering or providing background backstories for the people who show up at this um, Pentecost day in Acts. So thanks for the question. My number and name and email are right there at the bottom of your screen um, if you got any other questions or complaints. Bring them. Uh, let me know what we can do um, together. I, I like to hear from you with these. This uh, digital thing is kind of icky. I, I taught an in-person Bible study last Sunday for the first time in a long time, and it was cool. <laughs> People were asking questions. and um, So if you got any uh, feedback or questions, let me know. And uh, there is a week delay in my response, but it's a really good question. Or you really want to know right away, I'll respond directly to you and then maybe or maybe not include it for everybody else. All right. 
pushing the wrong button here, and now I'm pushing the right button. So to start, uh, we're starting now. We're, uh, what, 15 minutes into our study about time, Pastor. What is worship? We're going to talk about this. The purpose of worship. Who's the actor who benefits from worship? And, and I want to quickly just debunk or dispel or to clarify what worship is, because I think when we um, use that word worship, there's a lot of different uh, uh, things that have been loaded into it by our experience and by uh, the culture of the world around us. I think a lot of times what Christians think of when they hear the word worship is they think of praise. And, and, I, and I want to dispel you of that as much as possible and, and kind of uh, change this word worship for you. This might not happen tonight, um, but, but when you hear that word worship, pause, time out, what does it mean? Ask yourself, and, and I'd encourage you to say it is not praise. Um, it, worship is not synonymous with praise. Worship is primarily receiving. The purpose of worship is to receive gifts from God. So who's the, the actor in a gift-giving scenario? It's not the person standing there saying, give me the gifts. It's the person giving the gifts. And, and the person who benefits is the person receiving the gifts. So worship primarily, first and foremost, what God calls us to do, what we gather to do in the, in the church is to receive the gifts of God. And, and when, um, when we stop to think about that when we stop to revel in that and realize what is happening when we sit in those pews or in those chairs and in those places where God's forgiveness is spoken to us, where his body and blood are given to us, where baptism is, is celebrated in the midst of us. These places are places where we receive from God. And that kind of clarifies, clicks for us, that's where we need to be. That's what we want to do. Um, so, it's the Lord's giving, it's our receiving. That's the title of tonight's section um, in the, um, the, the study guide that I'm using for our, our um, outline here by Naomichi Misaki. So uh, let's start at the very beginning. Imagine a perfect world. And it just so happens we, we have a, uh, a vision of such a thing given to us in the Bible. Um, so this is my... National Youth Gathering Bible from 2016. Um, but we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, we're going to read uh, that for a while. And, and I want you to, as you're reading this, realize um, one thing that's uh, trivial, but also really cool to notice um, is that in the history of the recorded, recorded history of the world, the only place where we see a completely sinless, perfect world in the first two chapters of the Bible and if you fast forward, skip to the best part, last two chapters of the Bible also uh, give us a picture of a sinless world. Um, so one at the beginning, one at the end, the life of the world to come. So Genesis 2, beginning at verse 6, And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die." Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Um, so... Luther said, man was created for the knowledge and worship of God. Man was created for the knowledge and worship of God. What does this mean? Man was created for the knowledge and worship of God. So if we, if we understand with Luther that the purpose of our creation was worship, 
Um, real quickly, backing into what I said, dispelling our, our preloaded meanings for that word worship, we might say, yes, we're just supposed to praise God. That's, that's what we're created for, to praise God. But uh, I think it's, it's a beautiful thing because you see, what do you see the Lord doing? He creates a garden for the man he, or puts the man in a garden to take care of. And um, he, he gives the man a helper. He, he gives all the animals for the man's care. Um, so, so worship of God, receiving from God. Man was created for the knowledge of God, for knowing about God, and for receiving from God. If we, we think about it like that, um, the Lord is serving us with with blessings, with love, with the gifts of this world. We we um, we see that that could be a really cool way to think about it. And and I I would say let's let's think about it. We are created for the knowledge and receiving from God, as as opposed to what we might say of what we what we we try to put ourselves as the actors in worship. So um, so with that said. Who, um, who, who's the, the, the one that comes on the scene short after what makes, um, what comes against us? The, the devil comes on the scene. So let's see what happens. Um, so if that's God's primary purpose for creation, for the world, is, is to give us good gifts. Now, that might seem kind of selfish of us, but that's because we're sinful and we start to feel guilty about wanting things from God. But God's like, I just want to give you stuff. Why won't you take things from me? Take what I have and use it the way I want you to. It's, it's better that way. We're like, but is it really? That's, that's what it says, it says here. So now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He, that is a serpent, said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Notice she added a word there, or Adam added a word there when he taught her, but uh, verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, and, and sorry, just because God hadn't told them don't touch it, he just said don't eat it, and she said not touch it. Anyways, verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her quietly watching this whole scene unfold apparently and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden but the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Um, so verse 7 is, is huge for what our sinful nature is. This is the first time in the history of the world that humanity started to think about itself. All right, This is the first time a, a man or woman put her own needs and own self in front of the needs of others. That's what sin is. It's putting ourselves first, and, and we're called to put others before ourselves. All right, ver I got to finish this, uh, verse uh, 12 through 14. The man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now, notice the specific thing Satan was targeting when he tempted Eve. Let me go back here. Uh, the servant was more crafty uh, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? What's he attacking here? Uh, what's he targeting? It's, did God actually say? He's targeting Faith in God's word and God's word itself. Luther goes on to say in his commentary on Genesis, he says, For when the gospel is preached in its purity, men have a sure and certain guide for their faith and are able to avoid idolatry. But then Satan makes various efforts and trials in an effort to draw men away from the word or to corrupt it. So, so this is what the devil's target was. He wanted to undo the giving that God had, the giving of his word, the promise, provision, the protection, the love that God gave to his people. Satan's like, is that really there for you? Did God really say that? You're, he's calling into question that which God is and has done for his people. 
So sin comes into the world. They, they gave into temptation. Um, and, and, and despite the fall into sin, God comforts Adam and Eve with the promise of a Messiah who would be born to crush the head of the serpent. That's what we have right here um, in verse uh, 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There we go. Proto-evangelium. That's the first gospel. Proto-evangelium. First gospel. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat. Notice that's the other tree, tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, and live forever. So, so that which they were able to do before, live forever. Now God doesn't want them to do because they're in sin. And if they had lived forever in sin, it's not a good thing. Sin sucks. The, I'm sorry, sin is bad. And the world is not good with sin. And where we t live forever in this world with sin, the... Um, the joys that are waiting to be revealed. Anyways, it's, it's just a lot to think about, but we're not going to get into all of it today. So verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Whew. So Genesis begins with God, and, and Revelation ends with God and the lamb. And, and one of the things that, that happens here, um, the Lord God makes them garments of skin and clothed them. Now, it's not said, uh, but this is one of those church tradition things that I think is kind of cool to think about. What animal did God kill to make them clothing? Well, God sacrificed an animal to cover them. And, and what animal, uh, what um, animal is Jesus spoken of as being that is slain for the salvation of the world, well, uh, that would be a lamb. And so some have speculated and suggested that that um, that this was a lamb skin clothing that God made. Um, so that's kind of loaded, especially when you think about this. God, Genesis begins with God and Revelation ends with God and the lamb. And we see it potentially a lamb showing up here pretty closely, quickly, uh, uh, something that covers uh, their sin. So, so God comforts them with a promise. He says to the serpent, cursing the serpent, the offspring of this woman's going to crush you. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. It's, uh, it's, it's what's said there. So then he, he covers them with skin of animals whose blood had been spilt. First spilling of blood is not Cain killing Abel. It's God killing an animal to cover these sinners. Uh, your first parents. So um, Martin Luther notes that these skins served as a reminder to them to give thought to their wretched fall from supreme happiness and into the utmost misfortune of trouble. And in a sign, so this, I, you wonder if they watched this animal be killed by God. It was a sign to them that they are now mortal and they are living in certain death. Um, so, so God said, you will surely die, and, and something surely died in that moment, and, and death entered the world through sin, and so it would come. Um, because of humanity's fall into sin, God's atonement for our sin through the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, uh, it becomes the primary theme, the common thread, the consistent focus running throughout Scripture. So this sacrifice of an animal, we're going to get to Exodus in just a little bit here, and then we're going to skip to Hebrews uh, for quite a bit. Uh, but this shows us uh, a thread that runs throughout Scripture of, of sacrifices and the, the shedding of blood to cover sin and um, see what we can learn about this. So here's a, a picture of them in those skins. This was a Polaroid taken back in the day, uh, back in the garden. I'm just kidding. Uh, this is Gustav Dore, uh, Adam and Eve driven out of Eden, an engraving done in 1865. The angel with the flaming sword guarding the, it, keeping them from the tree of life uh, so that they wouldn't eat it and live forever. Um, so Revelation uh, points us to the lamb once again, though. And I heard every creature in, creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And uh, so that's picture of the the throne in revelation 5 but then revelation chapter 21 uh and i saw no temple in the city for its temple is the lord god the almighty and the lamb 
and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. The glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Um, and so that's the uh, the power of Christ for for God's children in the New Jerusalem that we look forward to. What a great day that will be! Um, and God's keeps on giving us the gifts to get us there, <laughs> to sustain us along the way. It's not a once and done. Oh, here's your ticket to heaven, kids. Now uh, just don't lose it. Um, here's your ticket to heaven. Now uh, let me keep supplying you with it because going to keep losing it. I, I mean, lots of ways you can think about this. So Exodus chapter 29, verse 38, um, looking at um, the sacrificial system as it kind of unfolded, even before Christ came into the world, God provided opportunities for his Old Testament people to receive his forgiveness of sins. So Exodus shows us one of the first, uh, one of the first, now let me see, I guess this would be the first um, institutionalized or divinely mandated, if uh, clearly directed, uh, ways that God provides means of grace, that is forgiveness of sins in a specific method. Um, and so Exodus 29, now this is what you shall offer on the altar, two lambs, a year old, day by day regularly. This is something they did every day. This is the priests, the Levites, um, <laughs> We were talking about my son Levi's name on the way to school last week, and Caleb um, is quite aware that his name means dog. It's not because I bring it up all the time. He just likes to talk about what words mean, and, and he, he knows that Levi is the um, named uh, both uh, that shows up in the Bible. Matthew's name was Levi, and also the Levi, the son of Jacob, and, and the Levites proceed. And so he said, how many? There must not have been a lot of Levites because they're... they're um, they were the priests. How many priests did they need? But this was a daily, this was a regular thing for them. So the Levi, Levitical tribe, um, the tribe without any land associated with them, but they were to uh, uh, do the sacrifices. Um, two lambs a year old, day by day, regularly. So this is, all right. Okay, verse 39, one lamb you shall offer in the morning and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the first lamb, a tenth of measure of fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hen of beaten oil and a fourth of a hen of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight and shall offer with it a grain offering and its drink offering as in the morning for a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. And it shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before your Lord where I will meet with you to speak with you there. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified, made holy by my glory. And I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. They shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So this is the... Um, Sacrificial system. Look at this verse as well. Exodus 20, verse 24. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and your sacrifices on it, your burnt offerings, and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to remember, be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. That's that's the forgiveness of sins. That's God coming um, to be with his people. Uh, that's what forgiveness um, is. It's God re reconciling us to himself. And, and so this is provided there in that day. So describe the divine service. And we, we use that terminology, divine service, um, quite often in our church uh, because we, we gather for the divine service. We're, today we're using divine service setting three. Um, and so these divine services literally means God's serving his people. Um, so this is uh, the method by which God is giving his people grace or sanctifying them, making them holy, blessing them. So this, this burnt offering that was done, and note the use of particular animals, a pleasing aroma of the Lord speaking and his blessing. So let's note these things. Although there are many Old Testament passages that discuss the divine service, Exodus uh, 29, as we read, we, we see the following four points. Number one, Old Testament worship was not humanity doing something for God, all right? So it wasn't just praise. It wasn't just thank. It wasn't just a response. It was primarily God doing something for the people. It was the divine service that God had instituted, the way by which he would do things for his people. While most English Bibles translate Exodus 29, verse 38, is this is what you shall offer on the altar. The Hebrew text says this is what you are to do on the altar. So the the, the idea to offer gives us an impression that, that the central point here is man's act of giving something to God. However, 
to do sounds strikingly remembrance of do this in remembrance of me, to do this do in remembrance of me. So there's, there's actions that we do, but it's not to please God. This is just the method by which we receive that, what God has to give us. So Christ's words giving us the Lord's Supper hearken back to do this. Um, that's cool. So, so maybe if you want to go back in your Bible real quick in Exodus chapter 29, um, verse, uh, verse 41, is that what we said? Well, you shall offer, um, you shall do this, you shall do it on the, off, um, on the altar. That's, that's where we are to do what God has given us to do. All right, so uh, second point, though. So the, so the first point is, is that um, God has instituted this. This is not us doing something for God. All right, second point is the Old Testament service is centered on the slaughtering and burning of accepted animals whose flesh and blood had been set apart, separated. The blood was used for then purification, and the flesh was burnt, providing a pleasing aroma and was a sign of God's acceptance of the sacrifice in his people who brought the sacrificial animal as well as his withdrawal of wrath and judgment. So that's what everything that's going on there is, is the, um, the, the slaughtering of these animals and, and that which um, it signifies God's acceptance of it, the, the shedding of the blood and the, the burning with the aroma, uh, pleasing to the Lord. Now, the third point, say four points? Sorry, I only... So the third point, <laughs> the purpose of such sacrificial service was for God to meet with his people at the sanctuary and to speak to them through Moses. The service, indicate, the service was God's appointed meeting, meeting place for them. The Hebrew used here indicates that it's not just people coming together as a congregation, but the Lord drawing them together. So, um, let's see. There is no fourth point. All right. We'll go on. Sorry, I said four. It said four, and now it's actually only three. Um, probably another one there. Those were pretty, pretty deep points. I don't know if I could plumb it out off the top of my head here. I definitely can't. So let's go on. We are now going to um, buckle up for a lengthy reading of, of Hebrews 9 and 10 now. I, I want you to listen to these passages um, thinking about, because uh, this is going to talk about the Old Testament way of worship and the New Testament way of worship, which is what you get to participate in. That's New Testament worship, um, the new covenant in my blood and, and the uh, forgiveness of sins, that, that which we receive when we gather for worship, uh, that which we receive when we gather to receive from God. Um, so listen to Hebrews 9 and 10 and see what it says for you in that. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness, for a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot speak now in detail. We've got a lot more details to go into. So, um, so that's the, the tabernacle that was set up, and, and he's describing it there. Now, verse 6, these preparations having then thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes. But he, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself, and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. All right, according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot be perfect, that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but only deal with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. I pushed the wrong button. Now I can push the right button. Sorry about that. Uh, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by, me, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bo goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer Sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more 
Will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our consciences from dead works to serve living God? So this is what Christ becomes. All of the sacrifices we're anticipating and are fulfilled in Christ. All right, so... Um, Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Ten commandments. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant is inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law has been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. Copies of the heavenly things, it's the, um, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, the, uh, uh, the tabernacle arrangement. So those are copies of the heavenly things. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Remember that Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim overshadowing the footstool. That was the presence of God on earth. And so the high priest would enter there. And now Christ goes into the actual heavenly place to intercede on, on behalf of us for God. Now, all right, sorry, staying with the text. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as a high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting on him. So that was chapter 9. Sorry, Hebrews is so rich, it's hard not to make comments, and it's impossible to make the comments that need to be made. Um, but So we'll just let chapter 10 for it speak for itself if I can. Right, so chapter 10, verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having been once cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have made, not desired, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written me in the scroll of the book. Uh, that's so, uh, yeah. Verse 8, when he said to me, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and write them, my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will not remember their sins and their lawless deeds anymore. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Wow. So, um, that is um, for you. Um, Hebrews 9 and 10. So just some thoughts on that. Remember, we're going to see the connections between the Old um, Testament worship and the New Testament worship. So uh, since the Hebrew uh, reading that we just went through is lengthy, um, we, we might not remember it all. I'm just going to read this summary here to help us uh, make some connections, some comparisons, contrasts between the Old Testament worship and New Testament worship. First, animal sacrifices were the chief part of the Old Testament divine service. However, these served only to point forward in time to the one perfect and final offering of Christ's body and blood on the cross. In the New Testament divine service, the chief parts are preaching and the administration of the Lord's Supper. Now, second, um, so those are the the prime parts, sacrifice of animals, preaching, and sacrifice of uh, the receiving of the Lord's Supper. Second, while God mandated Old Testament ceremonial worship, which also was fulfilled in Christ, the New Testament church centered its liturgy freely on the service of the word, taken from the familiar, um, at that time, uh, the early church time synagogue worship and the service of the sacrament, which is based on the Lord's institution of his supper. Third, the Old Testament sacrifices, priesthood, tabernacle, and temple were all fulfilled in Christ. Therefore, their use ceased. And, And it's kind of stunning that the Jewish faith continues, but there is no um, daily morning and evening sacrifice of a lamb as, as was instituted. That's, that's a, a great head scratcher for me. Um, what identified them for so long until Christ came um, is no longer done. But anyways, uh, Christ has become that <laughs> for us. Um, so in, in, the, um, in the New Testament, each believer is a priest having immediate access to God through Christ. Um, so you are the priesthood of believers, and we'll talk about that. I think that's week five's, session five's study on this. Uh, finally, as in the Old Testament, so also in the New, worship, in worship, God takes the initiative. He's the one who comes to serve his people with his grace. Uh, Martin Luther said once, for the Lord not only instituted the Lord's Supper, but he also prepares and gives it himself. He himself is the cook, the butler, he is the food, and he is the drink. So, I, there's just so much in that Hebrews 9 and 10. We could do a six-week study on those two uh, chapters, uh, but, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a um, picture of where we were and where we are as far as God coming to us and what we do in our, our life of worship. Now, uh, Matthew 28, verse 19 through 20, uh, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then on Luke 24, verse 46, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So the Lord gives us this instruction um, to do. This is what the church now is, is is to to tell of all things, to observe all things that I have commanded you, um, isn't just to love your neighbor as yourselves, but Jesus also tells us to take and eat, take and drink, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So doing the things of Jesus, uh, the Lord's Supper and baptism, are things that we're supposed to observe. Um, and, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. So you, you, the question might have creeped into your mind, why is preaching now so prominent where back then it was sacrifices? Um, Jesus says, go proclaim, go tell the good news, explain the story, tell everything about the Old Testament was pointing to me and everything that I've done is pointing you to eternity. Um, so this is a, a beautiful thing that we get from Jesus. First Corinthians 11 says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he's betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So why is Christ's sacrifice so central to New Testament worship? I hope you might be able to answer that yourself now, because we've talked about it a couple of times Jesus is the perfect sacrifice that all the other uh, sacrifices anticipated. So without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We read Hebrews 9, verse 22. All of Old Testament worship, ceremony, and law 
pointed forward to the coming of Christ, who is the fulfillment of these things. In the New Testament church, the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments objectively deliver because God's word does what God says it does. And so these things objectively deliver to the recipients the blessings and benefits of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. There can only be, and there are only, they are only received true through the gift of faith that is also given to us as well. So the New Testament worship centers upon Christ, what he He's done the salvation that he's achieved for us and that he delivers to us now through these means of grace that he's given to us. So uh, Luther said, no one can praise God without first loving him. No one can love him unless he himself makes known to him in the most lovable and intimate fashion. And he can make himself known only through these works which he reveals in us and which we feel and experience in ourselves. Now, Mary, uh, this is uh, Luther's commentary on Mary's Magnificat. Mary uh, not only offered her praises, my soul magnifies the Lord. I love that rendition of it. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. My Savior, Mary, singing God's praises. You you might say she's praising praising God. You might be inclined to say she's worshiping God, but um, God had already worshiped and given to her. Uh, She had already worshiped and received from God. So um, so she responds with praise, um, and, and she... She talks about consecrating her life that is worked out in her by grace. Uh, she, she gives her life to the Lord. Uh, Luther says this on the Magnificat. He says, My soul magnifies God the Lord. These words express the strong love and exuberant joy with which all her mind and life are inwardly exalted in the spirit. Therefore, she doesn't say, I exalt the Lord, but my soul does exalt the Lord. For if she, it's as if she said, My life and all my senses float in the love and the praise of God in lofty pleasures, so that I am no longer mistress of myself. I am exalted more than I exalt myself to praise the Lord. She's caught up, as it were, into the Him. She's caught up, as it were, into Him, and feels herself lifted up into His good and gracious will. All words and thoughts fail us, as our whole life and soul must be set in motion, as through, as though all that lived within us wanted to break forth into praise and singing. And this is what it is to, just. Ah, to know that God has delivered us and, and delivers to us everything we need to be delivered from sin, death, and the devil. And we are, we are secure in our Savior. And, and it's just a beautiful thing. And that's uh, that when we feel and experience those objective realities of the gifts that God gives to us in his word and in his sacraments, uh, we're feeling and experiencing something real. Um, apart from the word and sacraments, feeling and experience should never be trusted or leaned into. Um, But we want to definitely hear those things which is worth feeling good about. And that said, we don't always feel this. Sometimes it might seem monotonous and and work, and and we pray that God would... uh, What what was the prayer song we prayed at the beginning? Um, Our heart, our cold hearts, warm our cold hearts so that every thought and act be love. Anyways, I, I can't remember. Um, so Gerhardt said it better than my memory could recall. So how does Mary's humble faith express itself in word and deed? Well, she just devotes herself to the Lord, and, and, and her uh, Magnificat is a great picture of that for us. Now, Hebrews 13, verse 15 through 16, uh, through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And this is kind of the what then now, um, what then shall we do, right? So we we have this uh, wonderful gift giving to us God's grace in our life, but it, it bears fruit. What do we do? It, it gives, we give to the others. So the fruit of God's grace in our lives as in um, what, so what are examples of good please, God pleasing good works? Where do they take place and to whom are they directed? The fruit of God's grace in our lives, as in the life of Mary, includes when we confess his name, continue in the good confession, is what they said in Hebrews, right? Uh, Both in the divine service and to our neighbor, in the good works or sacrifices we perform to our neighbor. So changing the baby's diaper is one of my favorite Luther quote, and um, the most mundane and menial tasks take on a new meaning when we understood that it's done, understand that it's holy work, that it's done by a believer trusting in Christ's merits, it's a God-pleasing work. When it's covered in the blood of Christ, it's it's a God-pleasing work, and, and everything we do is is saturated with Jesus, baptized and, and bloodied. We are ready to be his body um, in this world. All right, so Romans 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, 
uh, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So our entire lives, including our bodies, are to be living sacrifices. And, and um, Matthew 25 gives us this picture. Where do our works show up? When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And he'll say to those on the left, Depart from me, you wicked, uh, you cursed, <laughs> into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then also they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Their question's different, isn't it? Uh, they're like, we did those things, didn't we? Then he'll answer them, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So these will go away into eternal punishment, the righteous into eternal life. Notice the righteous are not righteous of themselves. They're not looking for a self-righteous. They're just like, I didn't do that, Lord. And the Lord's looking at them and saying, you did it to me. Um, you did it for me. And um, the, the unrighteous, where do they lean into? We did it though, right? We, we did minister to you. Um, we, we did minister to the sick or hungry and just a different approach. And, and um, so such works which the Lord commands will be recognized on the last day and, and God enables them. And, and you may not even realize the good works that you're doing um, are blessed. Uh, your, the, the adornments of, of God's uh, blessing through you for those in the world around you. And, and it's just a wonderful thing to to know that we get to be, and, and we may not even know what we are, <laughs> right? All right, so another Luther quote for us. It's a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith we have. It's impossible for it not to be doing good works incessantly. It does not ask whether good works are to be done, but before the question is asked, it's already done them, and it is constantly doing. So how do we see the gracious gospel, uh, power of gospel at work in our lives? Uh, this is the flow of, of the forgiveness of sins, and so uh, let it be for you, the absolution, the forgiveness of sins for you, the baptism that into which you are baptized, the Lord's Supper which you receive, it fuels your fruit bearing for the world around you. And, and it's just something that happens. So get out of the way. Let God do his work for you and through you. All right. So there's a, a prayer we say after we receive the Lord's Supper. Um, and I, I pulled it up here on my phone because I didn't have all the words and I didn't want to butcher it and trying to re-say it. So let me uh, bring it up here. Um, so after the Lord's Supper, we say, we give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. Um, so that is the body and blood of our Savior, this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same. That is the same thing, this salutary gift. Strengthen us through this gift in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this prayer we say, it's actually a prayer written by Luther. It's from the Deutsche Mass, um, his German Mass of 1526. He translated the, the Latin um, Greek uh, Catholic Mass into the German language so that people could actually understand what's going on in church. <laughs> it would that we would still understand what's going on in church um, and take time to understand what's going on in church. So, so the leader... Um, uh, <laughs> The, uh, the leader of that prayer is, is, is praying on behalf of all that are gathered there. The pastor is praying and asking God to help us um, grow in faith uh, towards God, but also in love towards one another. And, and this is what we then go and do. Uh, we dark, depart in peace in the service of the Lord. And so next time you have the Lord's Supper, remember you're being fueled to be fruit uh, for the world. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah, we're at homework time right now. Uh, so... Uh, so homework, I got three parts and then a secret fourth one. It's coming up here in this, this box right there. All right, so encourage one another. Now that you've been reminded about who is doing the work in worship, it's, um, remind someone you know. It, when, you, when you're inviting that, that person back to church, 
uh, who's been away, whether for COVID or for other reasons, hey, come back to church or call the pastor, have him come bring you communion because um, God's got stuff for you. Uh, that's great. Um, find in the hymnal you stole from church or a pastor stole for you or that you purchased from cph.org, hymn 640, and, and meditate on those words. Thee we adore, O hidden Savior. Uh, ponder the wonder you can receive in the Lord's Supper. Uh, third part for homework, think about the parts of the worship service. Which parts are sacrificial? Those are the things that we do for God, such as prayer and praise. Um, we do do some things for God in worship. We, we thank him for the blessings. We, we ask him for things. Um, and which are sacramental, that is giving us the mysteries of God. And um, it's a neat way to do, and God forbid, if you're having a third commandment issue, if you're having a hard time remembering the Sabbath day, keeping it holy, if you're despising preaching in the word, um, this is a great way to engage your brain in the worship service that you're a part of as you're sitting there. Is God doing something for me or am I doing something for God? And it's neat to notice how, how the rhythm flows, but also how much God is giving us in our worship services. And then four, read or memorize. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17. That's what we're going to be talking about next week. Thank you. Do you have questions? I do. Um, we're going to leave them to the Lord, though, and uh, I will see you guys soon. Uh, let's go with the Lord's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Y'all have a great night.